Hello, um, thank you all for joining me today for my talk that I will present to you on proteomics of cellular dynamics and stress and infection. And first of all, we'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this chance to present this work to you. And as I was told that this is particularly also in the context of, of your training for um, postgraduate students, also try to give um, a much broader picture on some things than I would usually do, but also to explain a bit more, for example, in proteomics that I will focus on a lot in this presentation. And that's one of the major tools that we use in the lab um, to understand biology. So where am I? Where's my lab coming from? What's, what's the focus? What do we care about? And this is generally summarized here is um, cell stress. So we care about different types of stresses in different cellular environments. And it can actually be extracellular even, so things here, but environmental factors, including infection with viruses or bacteria, it can be the inside cells, whether in the cytosol, mitochondria, ER, nucleus, and so on. And the source can, of course, be multifold. It can be something, as I mentioned here, like infection, can be protein aggregation that might occur upon a fever or based on um, genetic mutations in, in some proteins that are prone to aggregate and to cause, for example, neurodegenerative diseases. It can be starvation and many other factors. And I think there are some common themes across um, these stresses that even though they originate in different places in the cell and are caused by very different reagents, there's something that, that occurs across all of them, that there's typically some signaling events that ends up in changes in transcription and translation so overall, they tend to change the proteome, which has in the end the functions in the cells and try to react to the stress to, um, yeah, to rewire in some ways the cells to deal with, with the stress. And if you look at the stress responses, as I mentioned, they can come from really a number of different um, sources. And then they result via transcription and translation in a large number of different outputs in the cell, whether it's cellular function, morphology, signaling, metabolism, proliferation, proteostasis, trafficking, and many more. And here, I think for me, one of the really defining or perhaps the defining feature of stress responses is that they're highly dynamic and they're typically global. So if you look at the stress response, this is what it very often looks like. This is now particular in response to protein misfolding. You have a stress, you activate a stress response here, and then this should hopefully overcome the stress. You have recovery and you're back down here. And if you look at stresses like ER stress, for example, um, this typically takes less than 12 hours. So it's really rapid. And then there's very particular responses here in the early part of it um, where we, for example, try to increase the folding capacity. This is usually by inducing chaperones and the folding load, for example, by shutting down translation. And it's really important that you end up in this recovery because otherwise end up in a chronic stress conditions and it can lead to cell death. And this is something that you, for example, observe in diabetes. Yeah, for us, very importantly, to understand the stress now, we need tools that allow us to look at this dynamic part here in the beginning to understand what are really the underlying signaling components, what are the key players, and how do the cells actually shut off the stress afterwards. And I think if you look at that in cells, you start with your stress, it typically leads to um, changes in transcription. As I mentioned before, this is often hundreds of thousands of different genes that are affected. And translation, which if it's um, one of the major stress responses, immediately affects thousands of proteins. And these, of course, lead to a large number of changes in proteins, RNA, DNA, lipids, metabolites, and so on, that ultimately integrate um, towards your cellular adjustments, your phenotype that you have. And I think it's quite clear for that that we can still learn a lot from studying a single um, a signal responses in stress. But if we want to understand how we get to this phenotype, we actually need to at least somewhat harness the complexity that happens upstream of that to understand what actually happens um, downstream here. And there we get into technical problems in some ways, because if you look at um, this connection, this is, of course, a kind of central dogma of biology, go from DNA to RNA and protein. There's also something else in there um, that proteins get modified, and you have this, I call it here now, protein asterisk. Um, yeah, proteins that have been post-translation be modified, whether it's a phosphorylation, acetylation, ubiquitination, or even cleaving off parts of it. And the difficult there, difficulty there is um, that we need different technologies to look at that. For DNA, we have genome sequencing, RNA, RNA sequencing, 
um, from translation, traditionally ribosome sequencing. And here we have proteomics. And as I mentioned, this is what we focus on in our lab. The tricky part is, if you look at the genome, we have about 23,000 genes that need to be sequenced. Here in transcription with isoforms, we're probably around 100,000. But here on proteins, we easily get to over a million different forms. And of course, that um, causes some burdens that are very difficult to overcome technically. And now focusing on the proteome, there's of course different aspects that get affected um, during stress. So if you think about, um, here's now with an example of protein misfolding, can do a lot of things. It can go um, change the proteome in the nucleus, can affect the ER, if you have stress responses there. So um, changing the proteome of specific environments of different specific organelles, also mitochondria, can change protein-protein interactions and complexes, can change the stability of proteins where we would need to look at the half-lives, um, total protein levels, and again, this post-translational modification. So again, the output of the stress is really multifold and ideally you need to have some form of multi-omics, even if it's just proteomics, this is already a form of multi-omics to understand on different layers what's going on here. And now we come to um, more in context of stress and infection. So if you think about the processes that underlie um, infection uh, that we need to monitor, so if you have your viral particle here, of course it needs to enter cells, you can theoretically already hear interact um, with cell surface react uh, receptors that could lead to some form of signaling already in the cells. And then of course, once the virus is inside the cells, there's also a number of, of effects it can have in proteins. It can be the viral genome copies or much more often um, the viral proteins themselves that interact with host factors, can activate signaling cascades, can change um, protein dynamics, for example, protein synthesis, protein degradation, and so on. And here there's a number of tools. This is um, just some of them, the most common ones, um, proteomics, it can help us to look at these different aspects here. It can be interaction proteomics here and there, those viral proteins with host factors, and um, protein dynamics, which I will focus on a lot, and that actually required a lot of new method development to be able to look at protein translation and degradation by proteomics. And it's also for signaling cascades, for example, phosphoproteomics, where we can look at the phosphorylation state of thousands of proteins in the cell and how that changes upon stress, upon infection. So at first I will give, uh, take a little bit of a detour to tell you a bit more about um, proteomics and the types of proteomics we do. So what we do is something that's called bottom-up proteomics and it's called bottom-up proteomics because of the way it's actually being done. So we start with, with um, cells, we extract proteins from them, we digest them into peptides and it's these peptides that we monitor in the mass spectrometer and that's where it's called a bottom up because we start from here um, differently from top down where you actually look at intact proteins. What we do is we take this complex peptide mixture, separate it um, via chromatography, and then we shoot it in a mass spectrometer and we'll get back to that. There might actually be several steps of measurements in the mass spectrometer to identify those peptides and to quantify them. And the reason why we need those several steps is shown here. So if you imagine any given peptide, um, for example, this sequence here, this is the exact mass that would be what we would measure in the machine. Problem is, you can also scramble this sequence here. So it's still the same um, amino acids. We have exactly the same mass, but it's a very different sequence. And of course, we need to know whether it's this sequence or that, because this peptide might stem from protein A, while this protein comes from protein B. So it's important to actually know what peptide are we quantifying here to know um, how that relates to the, the relevant protein levels. And the way to get at this um, information is to actually do several measurements in the machine. First, we measure the whole peptide in what's called an MS1 scan, so the first scan. And then we fragment the sequence as shown here. We break the peptide bonds. And now you have the left-hand side of the molecule and the right-hand side is also called B and Y ions. And we shoot them separately. So it's shown here. This would be an MS1 scan. Now we have the densities for all the different peptides. And then you usually run a top 10 or top 20 method, which means you take the top 10 or top 20 most intense peaks, for example, this one. And then you do this fragmentation that I mentioned. You measure your B and Y ions. And now you know what the sequence was of your peptide and can use this information to now tell um, what was the quantity of the different peptides and from that relate back to um, changes in protein abundance. 
And so now we get to a full picture of what I showed you before. Um, we have this workflow here, and of course you need to quantify there's different methods. One is to essentially go label free, that's what I just showed you. You just shoot one sample after the other. You look at the intensities in this first peak and the peptide intensities, and you quantify from there. And then there's also um, it's different steps here. We can use different quantification um, methods. I think the most common ones are either on the cell level, for example, is silic labeling, so metabolic labeling, where you change um, amino acids from a light to a heavy version with naturally occurring isotopes. And also there's a lot of methods available on the peptide level. Um, I think something that's become very prominent over the last years is isobaric tags, for example, TNT, and I will get um, give you a bit more information about those um, very soon. And then on the biology side, there's also things that are very interesting. This is here, the enrichment strategy. Um, anything you can enrich from a cell, you can of course look at, it can be or might be your different um, organelles or compartments in the cells to measure, but you can also enrich, for example, pull down a protein of interest and you can see what comes down with it to get um, protein interaction information or to look at uh, post-translational modifications. These are usually quite substoichiometric, so you need to pull down those modifications, for example, here, phosphorylation and titanium oxide, to then look which peptides were phosphorylated and how does it change. And as I mentioned, we really focus a lot now on this um, TNT, on this tandem mass tax. And for us, it's been really great, especially in the context of biological samples, because this um, tandem mass tax, this TNT allows to multiplex. Yeah, so what it enables us to do, we can still take our proteins, our protein soup digested to peptides, and now we have these little tags. And actually at the moment, we have up to 16 of those tags. And yeah, so we can take up to 16 different samples. Every peptide in solution will be labeled with this TNT, at least in an ideal world. And then these tags allow us to pull it all together into one sample that contains now all of these up to 16 samples. And uh, Great part here is now we can take this pool, we can also um, do extra fractionation steps and then shoot them in our mass spectrometer. And these tags are actually isobaric, which means they all have exactly the same mass. And this is really great because it means for every peptide, we still only get one peak that is the summed intensity of all these 16 different samples. So we don't get 16 different peaks, that would be pretty bad if we get one. It also means if we look at this peptide from one sample, of course, we look at it from all the other ones. And only in the machines later, we, we, um, we um, fragment and are able to quantify now those tags. And the way this works now is shown here on this side. So this is actually um, two of these um, TNT tags, the NHS esters. So they will um, <clears throat> interact with the end terminal end of your peptides, also with um, lysines. And this here is the molecule. And I think what's quite apparent, they have the same kind of chemical structure However, they also have heavy isotopes. Here they're indicated with these red circles. And this top molecule, there's five in the right-hand side of the molecule. Here there are five on the left-hand side of the molecule. This would still have the same mass. However, in the machine, when we fragment the peptide or even in an additional step in an MS3 measurement there, um, this bond here is broken. And now we have this part of a reporter. And I think here it's quite apparent the mass is different. So this is a trick that we use to be able to tell how much of any given peptide was in sample one, two, three, four, and so on. So this is our way for a relative quantification across the samples. And for completeness, I mentioned this to you. So this is something that has been optimized a lot over the last 10 years. And there's really been, there were some problems with it in the beginning that I think hampered a little bit um, how this TMT was used. And one is shown here, so if you take a, a yeast lysate with known ratios, so for example, 10 to 4 to 1, to 1 to 4 to 10, and now mix it with another lysate, in this case from a human cell line, what we observe is that we don't get this perfect 10 to 1 ratio anymore. Instead, there's some interference and we have a ratio compression, so it's not 10 to 1 anymore, it's only 3 to 1. So it's still in the same, uh, in the correct direction that things that are supposed to go up, go up. Um, but it's not so accurate anymore. And it turned out the reason for that is this year, um, if we do this early scan that I mentioned, you try to pick out your peak and look at that, but in this isolation window, you can always have a number of contaminating ions and this will lead to this interference. And then in work, um, in 
Steve Geeky's lab, um, it was a neighboring lab to where I did my postdoctoral work, they found out a way to overcome this. And this was to add a third measurement step in your TMT um, experiments. So we still do a first an MS1 scan uh, for the peptides. We do an MS2 to get the sequence of the peptide. And then we particularly here um, pick out these um, reporters to measure in an MS3. And with that, and it's, it's good to see here, you can see that the ratios here with the MS3 method actually very close back to what they were supposed to be um, if there's no interference. And I think this overcame a lot of these issues and there was a whole new generation of machines that were brought on the market. Um, that now I think enabled us pretty well to do, or to use this team T method um, for proteomics and cells. So with that, um, you still have kind of a standard um, experimental workflows. It doesn't matter where your proteins come from, whether it's organelles, a PTM modified phosphorubiquitin whole cell, or even a plant or, or whatever else you want to measure and still do your proteomics. Now you have up to 16 conditions, which of course allows you to do different treatments, time courses, replicates, and so on, and pull them all together in one. And of course, this saves a lot of machine time and it also can avoid a lot of artifacts because very often, at least in human cells, to get deep, we want to fractionate them to actually shoot a lot of fractions of one sample to, to get to seven, eight, nine thousand proteins. And this is much easier if it's pooled already because then this fractionation will affect all the different samples in the same way. And of course, this can be combined with a lot of things you want. You can do kinetics measurements over time. You can look at whole cell proteomes. You can look at organelles here at some mitochondria, or you can combine it even with IPs. And here's a number of papers from the last years that kind of exemplify the different things you can do with that. So far, TMT is a really great tool that um, can be used. And we reverse here, and I had this slide before, we were at this um, cell stress response, and we really tried to understand, um, yeah, what do these responses look like? How are they similar or different for different stresses? And, we figured out, of course, something that's very highly dynamic, much more than the proteome that takes a long time to change. Translation is highly dynamic. And we wanted to understand how does translation change upon cellular stress. And we focused here, particularly on the integrated stress response and mTOR, which are really the two central hubs to adjust cells to a large number of different stresses, whether it's folding, starvation, infection, and many others. And and they typically activate or inhibit um, these two players. And there's a number of outcomes. Um, I'm sure you've heard of them in, in many different talks, famous for mTORs, for example, activation of autophagy in the integrated stress response, a lot of changes in transcription. But the common thing really is that both of them block translation. And the combined uh, effects of those, uh, of course, for example, change in metabolism and proteostasis. But I really wanted to understand better what are to the roles of the integrated stress response and mTOR and attenuation of translation, and what are the targets of this regulation? And there, this is really the situation where we were at. So this is kind of a textbook um, introduction of translation and how this is initiated. So you have um, different aspects of it. Here's um, the pre-initiation complex formation. So with the ternary complex where we need EF2 and EF2B as a um, good night exchange factor and yeah, where you form this pre-initiation complex it will then go to the cap structure on an mRNA um, to start translation there in the end after recruiting the large subunit and the important part as I just mentioned is this cap structure yeah, where there's an, another part of the complex with this for example 4e proteins that bind here and help with um, recruitment of this um, initiation complex and per textbook, this is where mTOR and integrated stress response um, act. Integrated stress response leads to phosphorylation of EF2 alpha, which forms a complex with EF2B. And this cannot happen then anymore and to prevent this ternary complex formation. While mTOR1 is a kinase, um, it's kind of the pathway, if you want to say so, it's activated by actually inhibition. So usually it would phosphorylate 4E binding protein 1 if mTOR is inhibited. 4E binding protein 1 is not phosphorylated anymore. It really then binds to 4E. 4E cannot sit here at the, pre, um, at the cap anymore to help with this pre-initiation complex. So these are the two ways. Both of them affect translation. And if you look here from the textbook page, the outcome should actually be pretty similar across those two different stresses. 
However, um, if you look at the data that's out there, it's a bit different. And I think this is actually largely um, exemplifies the technical difficulties one can have with those types of studies. So the standard way to look in translation, and we actually also did this in the context of these stresses, is to use ribosome profiling, or called riboseq, where you purify your polysomes, you digest um, the RNA, where you will only have left over now these pieces of mRNAs that are protected by ribosomes. You can release those, sequence those, and get an understanding where your ribosomes were sitting and what's actually being translated. And the outcome of that is, this is um, one example here from Nature paper in 2012 from the Sabatini lab, where this was exactly what was done. They used mTORC1 inhibition here with TORIN1. And you could see that overall globally translation was shut down by about 70%. If you look at the polysome profiles, you can see the same here with the taurine one. Most of the polysomes are gone. And this is the result of the um, ribosome profiling. So they profile about 5,000 mRNAs. And you can, as you can see here, it's normally distributed around zero. What that means, um, if you look at the global picture here, translation did not change. So this does not resemble those 70% um, change in translation that we saw over there. But based on this, um, distribution you can then still tell which mRNAs are affected. And here there was suggested about 250 mRNAs that were decreased and, and or the translation of which was decreased. And I think it's quite clear that there's some discrepancies in some ways between um, what's shown here and what's shown on the left hand side. And this is something that's actually well known. It has nothing to do with that the authors did, did any mistake here or something went wrong. It's just a technical limitation that was described so here, for example, this paper by um, Ignolio together with Jonathan Weissman really made this ribosome profiling big. And it's quite clear that there's a normalization artifact that can actually happen in all next generation sequencing um, approaches, but ribosome profiling is, is particularly sensitive to that. And that is in situations where we observe global unidirectional changes in expression, such as treatments that cause a global decrease in translation, as we observe here, these assumptions lead to inaccurate quantification. And the assumptions are that the input is comparable. So what happens here is you purify those polysomes and those, you put the same amount in more or less, you do PCR steps, and it normalizes away these effects and it ends up with this perfect distribution around zero that we see here. And this has caused some problems because as you saw, there's not much changing. And the same is true if you look at the integrated stress response and has led the field to really believe um, that mTORC in the integrated stress response are separate and independent pathways. However, that doesn't match with um, the biological findings, for example, here described in the tumor, and micro tumor microenvironment, where it's pretty clear that the phenotype, the outcome of those pathways is actually quite comparable. So there we were really stuck. And as I mentioned, we wanted to understand what is actually changing. Um, how is translation affected by these different pathways to understand what is the role of translation in stress. And we thought that it's got to be a way to overcome this issue using proteomics. And of course, there is this, this method that has been used for many years by a lot of labs and people around the world. And the idea is there, you have your cells in culture at time point zero, they're cultured through the absolute normal way as you always do with your regular DMEM or whatever medium you use. And they essentially have the normal amino acids included. And then in the time point zero, you change, you change, for example, lysines and arginines to a heavy version. Heavy means that they have, for example, 13 carbon instead of 12 carbon. Yeah? So it's a naturally occurring isotope that's enriched in these amino acids. It's something cells don't realize that there's anything different, but this mass difference is big enough that by um, proteomics, by mass spectrometry, we can easily determine whether a protein has a light or a heavy amino acid in there. And if you do that over time, you can then of course follow for every individual protein, how the heavy um, percentage of heavy peptides or protein um, relative to the light increases over time. And this is essentially a translation rate of those proteins. Now there's one problem I told you, we want to um, look at dynamic changes. We want to be able to treat a cell or infect a cell and then look what happens after one hour to two hours to three hours, somewhere in that range, because this is where we want to be on this curve that I mentioned. And the problem there is that we are essentially in this red box here. And the red box, it means the changes are minute. We usually only have several percent of heavy labeled proteins at that time point. And this is really where we had big troubles with the exact, um, existing um, methods that were there. And I really want to mention at this point, 
um, a brilliant PhD student in my lab who's now a postdoc in the lab, Kevin Klan, who he was spearheaded this work. And I think you will see his name several times more in the future. He's really been involved in a lot of the efforts in my lab. And what we tried here first is just to look how well do this um, typical ways of monitoring this here, how do they work? So we artificially mixed together um, samples, lysates from cells um, that have between 0.1% and 10% heavy label. Yeah? So to kind of simulate this, this, um, this situation here and look how well we can measure it. And I think it's quite clear from here, we know what the percentage should be because that's how we mixed it. And this is what we measured. It actually does not work very well, particularly at this low percentages. And if you look, and this is the flip side of it too, if you look at this low percentages, we also identified very, very few peptides. And it's not something where we could say really monitor translation across the proteome. And the reason for this issue is quite simple. Um, as I said, only a few percent of your protein is heavy. So the heavy peak is very small. It's actually much smaller as depicted here um, when compared to the light peak. So in the end, the machine takes the top peak. So once you can see very well, and essentially you have somewhat of a measurement threshold and most of the heavy peaks are below that, this will be not selected in the machine. It will not be measured and will not be getting any quantitative information on that. And what we thought should be possible um, is to overcome this issue is to use a trick in combining this, what's called pulse cyclic labeling that we do here with this TNT that I mentioned earlier, because that allows one, we thought, great trick. As I mentioned, TMT is isobaric. Yeah, so all the samples here, we can up to, have to up to 16 samples, they all have exactly the same mass. And that allows us to take one of the channels and to use now a lysate that is 100% heavy labeled. Yeah? And that alone is enough to push us above this measurement threshold. And then we will be able to select this peak. And then from this peak using TMT, we can then still tell how much um, was in every individual sample. What is the translation in here compared to this boost channel? And this is what we described in, in this paper here in a method that we termed um, MEPROT for multiplexed enhanced protein dynamics and you know, proteomics. And it works quite well. And this is shown here as a workflow just as before. We have the same percentages again as before. We now have a boost channel 100% heavy and also a noise channel that we use from, um, to determine the, the background that is 0% labeled, can pull them together, shoot them. And this is what we get out of that. And I think it's quite apparent here that even at very low um, heavy ratios, um, we do still get a very accurate quantification. This is comparison from the silic I showed you just before. Now, our MEPROT data here in orange, the MEPROT gives a very accurate quantification, while with the silic we couldn't. And we have very little variance in this method. You can hardly see here in one sample this bit um, of the variance there. And it works quite well across a large dynamic range. So here it's artificially mixed again between 0.1% and 80% heavy. I think it's, it's quite clearly here on a linear scale. And it also works in cells. Yeah, so if you look in HeLa cells labeled between 15 minutes, 30, 60, 120, um, it's quite robust, it's, it's linear, the replicates are tight. So we were at a point here we could use this method um, quite robustly also in cells. And just because I mentioned this before, that this can be this issue with ratio compression with TMT, it turns out because of um, us also having this noise channel for which we can determine what is the background we measure, we actually don't need to measure an MS3. Of course, this is an extra measurement step in the machine that costs some time and we lose some sample in the end. Yeah, but here MS2 performed just as well as MS3, so we had no need to shoot with an MS3 method. And then we applied this method looking at the cellular stresses that I mentioned, we inhibited mTOR1 or, you know, or activated the integrated stress response by leading to a phosphorylation of EF to alpha, and then looked at the translation outcome. So here is very similar to the ribosome profiling data I showed you before. We, we again here also use TORIN1, and I think it's quite clear on a global scale, we can see this, this really huge reduction in global translation rates. But now for the first time, we were able for thousands of proteins to look which protein specifically had a decrease in translation after inhibiting mTOR. And mind you, this is a log two scale. So a minus five, this is a lot already. Yeah? We are talking about changes in the range of 10 to 100 to even a thousand fold uh, um, decrease in translation. And then we also looked at the integrated stress response using Topsy Guardian to um, 
and activate PERC as a EFTF of kinase. And there too, we globally see this reduction in translation and we could monitor on the individual protein level what that meant um, for translation. And I will not take this story here much further. We compared the profiles and become very quickly quite apparent that there's actually uh, a vast overlap in the targets of those two different pathways. I think it's large now because we really could see most of the proteome, um, what's happening there and what it turned out. And this is summarized here. Um, mTORC and integrated stress response actually largely inhibit the same set of targets, the same set of, of um, mRNAs. So it's not um, a, a pathway specific regulation here of mRNAs, but instead, and I will not talk about that, there's intrinsic factors in the mRNA that define how sensitive they are to um, decrease in global translation levels. Yeah? So what we observed here is something like this. If we look at global translation, yeah, even very mild stresses that affect global translation, there's a set of mRNAs that very quickly um, stop being translated upon this mild stress as well. Some come later and later, and actually there's a set of largely housekeeping genes that were not affected by at least um, somewhat physiological context, like for example, um, mTORC inhibition of, or integrated stress response activation. They always remained up here. The only way to reduce those would be using something like cyclohexamide, which really blocks um, translation altogether. So with that, we were at this point, we had this method, I mentioned this, MEPROT, where we were able to look at um, the nascent chain, translation on the nascent chain level by using this pulsed silic labeling. And we had this booster signal that allowed us to detect this, the signal and be able to quantify it. So what we had is a highly acute translatome measurement based on the nascent chains. Um, we had none of this normalization bias that I mentioned before. It's pretty standard um, proteomics workflow in general. So we need very few cells. We can do that with much less than 100,000. It also makes it quite cheap, especially when compared to um, doing ribosome profiling. You can do quite a good throughput. Um, you can do dozens of samples at a time and we could have full proteome coverage. And I will just mention this here quickly because I think it's one of the examples we can see um, how you can take this further um, with learning about your system. Um, we rapidly also improved this method um, in a simple way that, that made huge differences. I mentioned to you, this is what your, your scans look like. Yeah? You have all those peaks. And of course, if you do this pulsitic labeling, we ideally have a light and a heavy peak. And this is our pair, the old protein, the new protein. And we only care about those pairs. We don't care about this, this gray peaks that are here in between. But if you usually run this, this experiment with the data dependent acquisition, we'll measure all those peaks. So we'll waste a lot of time on, on these gray ones. And it turned out there's, um, there's tools of using instrument logic within the mass spectrometer to, when it does this uh, first scan, determine those pairs up front and then only select those pairs for the MS2 measurement which saves a lot of time. And as it turned out, um, we call this um, a TMD method for targeted mass difference. And it turns out both on the MS2 and MS3 levels, it can about triple the number of identified heavy peptides. So with that, we were quite set up to use it in different um, contexts. And one that we tried out is bacterial infection. And I think it really shows the strength of looking at translation instead of just proteome. So we had cells. And that was in collaboration with the Dickage lab here in Frankfurt, where cells were infected with um, salmonella. And then after one and four hours, we looked at the proteome and the translatome. This here is the proteome. And you see a lot of changes. However, all these red circles, these are all the bacterial proteins. These significantly changed. If you look at the host cell, I think it's quite clear nothing changed. Yeah, so these early time points that then for measuring dynamics, um, proteome measurements are actually quite bad. However, it looks very different now looking at the translatome. This is the same one hour time point, but looking at the translatome, I think it's quite clear a lot of things change. So it gives us much more power now to look at a much more time resolved way how things change over time. You know? For example, from control to one hour to four hours, and then to determine what's going on in those cells. And this is something that we used back then um, to try and understand really what are the cell stress responses to different forms of, of infection. I just mentioned the bacteria. But it also came at the time we started a number of collaborations and looking at viral infection. And we want to focus on this translation aspect. And I think our efforts got quite derailed in some ways, but 
were strengthened in another way by the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, so I'm located in Frankfurt in Germany. It's the biggest airport in Germany, one of the biggest in Europe. And typically when there's a disease breaking out somewhere in the world, it often ends up quite quickly in Frankfurt. And it's because of the airport. And the same happened here. So on February 1st of last year, there was an evacuation flight from Wuhan. It brought people from Wuhan to Frankfurt. And two of those people were actually infected. And then something started was really with a beautiful um, collaboration with the virology department here in Frankfurt to study that. And really our starting point is where we thought is at that point, um, this was the situation. Of course, it was clear COVID-19 is happening and there were already a lot of compounds suggested and getting started to be used in the clinics. And it turned out where these compounds came from were these two pathways. One is essentially use in literature, and I called it NCU Rebrum. So people thought about what they know about other viruses and thought, let's try out some of those compounds now in COVID-19 patients, or using the same types of literature and using in silico abroad, just getting here. And what we thought we should, uh, what would be great to have is some actual data you know, to, to understand what does the infection do to cells? Can we from that identify what are the important pathways in cells that might be required for viral replication? And from that to identify our potential targets. You know, so we wanted to set up a cell infection system and then use any proteomics to do systems biology approaches to identify our targets. So we'll go back to, to this scheme that I had earlier about what proteomics can do. And I will now go through the different stages, kind of how we went through it from protein dynamics, interaction proteomics, and phosphoproteomics. So we'll start here on this side. And this is really how we started. It was this collaboration, as I mentioned, with Denisa Boykova and Jindri Sinadl. And they mentioned with, uh, managed within days to set up a cellular infection system for SARS-CoV-2. So they infected here CACO2 cells with um, SARS-CoV-2 and see a quite clear cytopathic effect here. So cells were infected. And as measured by um, quantitative PCR, they were also producing virus in the supernatant. So we have the system now where we could look at what are the host cell responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So I mentioned we use this CACO2 cells um, infected with this patient isolates. And then we use this MEPROT method that I mentioned. We looked at um, translation and the proteome after two, six, 10, and 24 hours. And then we use this multiplexing as common MEPROT fractionation and shot that on the mass spectrometer and then looked at the host cell responses. And some of the facts are summarized here. So this is a principal component analysis, which just globally describes how things are changing or not. And I think it's quite apparent here that starting with six hours, but particularly 10 and 24 hours post-infection, um, proteomes and here shown translatomes started changing quite extensively. And then looked at this into detail. Here's an example with viral proteins. You can see here in the infected cells, um, translation of this viral proteins increased and increased over time, um, while the mock controls stay down here. And quite interestingly, if you looked at the host cell at the translation, and I think this was one of the striking observations then, um, globally, the host cell translation didn't change that much. There was some decrease here, about 23%, um, 10 hours post-infection overall, and the effects were not huge. And this is something that's still keeping us busy. But now to the power of omics, what can we do? So here's over time, um, the mock infected SARS-CoV-2 infect this on triplicates, and we looked at clusters of, of um, proteins that changed. And we really wanted to identify um, drug candidates that could be hopefully brought to the clinics. So we focused on a cluster of things that increased after infection with the hope that we could then use inhibitors to prevent this, to prevent um, viral replication. And in this cluster, we found um, a couple of interesting things. Um, I will only focus on some of them here is that we really had a strong hit for um, spliceosome, pre-RNA splicing and, and, and so on. And we thought this would be, could be quite interesting. I think it's something that still a year later now fascinates us quite a bit that splicing is something that pops up in a lot of our studies. I think there had been some supporting um, data in the literature where people had looked at, at individual or different viral, um, viral proteins in cells and then the interaction profile. And for a couple of them, they already identified some um, splicing factors. So we thought we would test um, blood in light B, which is a spliceosome inhibitor for SF3B1. As you can see here, this really quite potently with a, a low nanomolar IC50 prevented replication of a virus in cells. And so shown here, this axis is inhibition of viral replication. 
And here, um, this um, increasing doses of the compound, and you can see here that this prevented um, bioreplication. And then we went on. Another um, aspect that we found we thought was quite striking is um, carbon metabolism, particularly glycolysis. And there we tested two deoxyglucose, uh, which inhibits, inhibits hexokinase, and it prevented um, viral replication as well. And this to us was quite interesting at the time because there had already been papers out for rhinovirus where people had tested two deoxyglucose um, against rhinovirus in a mouse and saw um, inhibition of viral replication there. So we thought it would be a good candidate. And then kind of a completely different story now. The study that I just mentioned is published and you can look up the data in the paper. And we also have much more in, in, on our website. Now a comparison to an unpublished study, this is here in, in primary cells. So this is really from a patient. It's a surplus material from the surgery where we looked in the kidney if proximal and distal tubal cells infected those with SARS-CoV-2 and MERS-CoV, and then also looked at proteome and translatome levels over time. This is a total of 72 samples in six multiplexes. It was quite a massive experiment. And I will summarize it up somewhat I mean, to the interesting parts here for SARS-CoV-2. If you look at the translatome, um, I think I appreciate that this was a different picture from what I had just shown in the CACO2 cells and the distal and the DTCs. Um, it's actually similar. There's not a huge global effect on translation, but then the proximal tubular cells um, here was a massive reduction in, in translation. So I think what that makes very clear is that it's really cell type and tissue specific. Um, what are the effects of the viral infection on translation? And if you look on the proteome side, it's, it's a bit different here. We have really a massive increase at this late time points in, in a large number of proteins. And here too, I'll just summarize it there. We looked at um, viral target and drug interaction networks to identify drug targets that, that could play a role. And we identified a number of, of clusters here. Um, I will just now go to the interaction proteomics and I will mention it in one slide because we haven't contributed anything here to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but it is of course a very important and, and, and informative way to get some information this is an example here. This is now from this paper from the Pischelmeyer lab, but there were, for example, also these two really great papers from um, the Krogan lab, where they expressed um, viral proteins, often in hex cells, or so it's overexpressing those. And then you look in pull downs, what they interact with, and then can identify what are the interactors, are there common targets also across, you know, as was done here, viral or you know, similar viral proteins from SARS-CoV-2 versus SARS-CoV or or HCOV, and then try and identify important clusters here. Um, we don't do that much of that, particularly um, because I mentioned all to you, because it's so important to understand the dynamics. And of course, getting this in a time resolved manner is quite difficult by IP. I want to mention though, and this is something we, we use quite extensively now, there's this proximity labeling approaches where you can have a bait and it gets tagged with, uh, for example, biotin ligase and with biotin late and everything in close proximity, for example, interactors. And this can be done in 10 minutes. So this is something that is highly time resolved and you can look over time how interactions change. And there's actually now a number of papers or, um, SARS -CoV on SARS-CoV-2 where this has been done and it's in bio archives, I'm sure that will come out soon. Now, just move to the last part of this signaling components looking at phosphoproteomics. And there we have another story where we did this and it's kind of a similar to design to, um, to the first SARS-CoV story we used is CACO2 cells infected them in five replicates of MOC for SARS-CoV-2, um, pooled them together and looked at the total proteome and the phosphoproteome. This was quite challenging because especially in the beginning, we could only affect very few cells. So we we're actually working with just a couple of micrograms of, of peptides here, but nevertheless, we managed to fractionate this a little bit in four fractions and we were able to monitor about 16,000 phosphocytes. And I think it's quite apparent here that there were a lot of changes in phosphorylation um, after infection with SARS-CoV-2. And some of the things that one can do here, we first looked at, at viral proteins. Um, they show phosphorylation pattern, of course. We tried to analyze somewhat which cellular kinases are involved with that. The difficulty there is um, to say very honestly, we still for most of these proteins understand very poorly what their cellular function is, and especially also what this phosphorylation might do to their activity and function. So we're not yet at a point where we can deduce a lot from that. But there are some interesting things, for example, this RNA binding domain here of nuclear protein N, there's 
a very similar domain that for which there is a structure and this phosphorylation sites that found here are actually all on the same surface. So I think one might speculate that this could affect how this protein is interacting or this, how this viral protein is interacting with host factors and could in such a way affect um, cellular behavior. So more interestingly, we again looked at the global scale. What, what are the changes in cells? We looked at um, for all those fossil peptides that we detected, how does phosphorylation of that protein change? How does this relate to changes in protein levels and so on? But as I mentioned, what we really wanted to identify was drugs that could be um, tested. And for that, we overlaid all this information we had on the phosphorylation change in the pathways with um, a library of FDA approved drugs for which the target is known and then cluster them together for pathways that were, were stimulated by infection and for which there's also um, drugs available. And this, there was one really very clear cut um, outcome. There was, is that there was this massive regulation of um, growth factor receptors of EGF receptor, for example, including um, downstream signaling and so on. And of course it plays an important role in cancer. So there's a large number of, of drugs available of that. And I would just like to point out this dexamethasone here, which is of course kind of the standard therapy now for COVID-19. But we follow this up and I think here is a bit more detail. So we found that if, um, if you look at the growth factor receptor um, and also downstream signaling, RAS-RAF signaling and AKT mTOR, uh, this was all activated. So this is shown here in these circles. The circles mean um, uh, it's the phosphorylation data of that. If there's two sites here, we found two phosphorylation sites. Here's one, there's four. If it's red, there was increased phosphorylation, blue decreased, and I think it's quite apparent that we saw on several steps um, activation of these pathways here. We also found some interesting other ones like receptor endocytosis, cytoskeleton remodeling, and um, integrated stress response, but I will not get into more detail here at this point. What we did try though is that we found, so I mentioned EGF receptor, we actually found a number of growth factor receptors that were um, activated upon infection. And the common theme is that they feed into those um, signaling pathways. So we tried out a number of um, compounds and drugs that are available to block this downstream signaling at different points. And here's the curves for those five and all prevented um, viral replications in cells with IC50s that are actually quite close to the Cmax, so the concentration that can be achieved in, in people. And here's another essay looking at qPCRs that also showed that these compounds prevented um, the production of viral copies in the supernatant. So with that, already at this point, we would like to summarize, I told you different, about different stories. Here, this development of this MEPROT assay that allowed us to look at acute translatome changes and we use this to characterize um, mTOR and the integrated stress response. We established this in vitro system for SARS-CoV-2 replication. And we found, and I hadn't mentioned all of them, we found that inhibitors of translation, splicing, glycolysis, nucleate acid biosynthesis, and proteostasis all prevented SARS-CoV-2 replication in cells. We then went on to look at the signaling of infection, looking at phosphoproteomics, and there we identified growth factor receptor signaling as really a key part um, for viral replication in cells. And I also mentioned to you this, this model in the primary human cells um, where we also characterize changes here. So with that, um, the last thing is the kind of a timeline what has this actually brought us. So this first paper I mentioned, there was um, particular two compounds in here, this riparine, which um, I didn't go into details with. Here is now from um, clinicaltrials.gov, the number of clinical trials that are ongoing with riverine. The judgment is still out, but there's at least some um, supportive evidence that it might play a positive role in COVID-19 patients. This 2-deoxyglucose has really been picked up, for example, by this company, Moleculin, which has um, precursor compounds of those and then preclinical trials there. And quite recently, it was actually um, accepted as a, as a treatment for COVID-19 in India. So they're using 2-deoxyglucose. They're now for treating COVID-19 patients. And dexamethasone, I think, doesn't need extra introduction. This is very clear in our um, fossil proteomics paper. And at around the same time, just months, two months later, it was shown that here um, dexamethasone can be used to um, treat people and growth factor, growth factor signaling this is still something that's ongoing. We actually patented on those, and we'll see um, what will come out of, of this research. So with that, I would really like to thank my lab. Unfortunately, that's the only complete picture one can get at the moment.
And there's really key players. I mentioned Kevin Klan also showed Anisha who worked in this kidney cells and Georg and Martin are really important for support on the mass spec side. Also want to mention really our great collaborators on the virology side from Yindrich, Denise, Benjaminko, Sandra, Zizek and Patrick Bales in Frankfurt who has this um, kidney models. And here are another set of um, virology collaborators from Marburg in this case. It's quite important. I'm also heading our quantitative proteomics unit and it was of course quite important for this work. And I would really like to thank um, the different funding sources I have in the lab that made this research possible. With that, I would like to thank you very much for joining me today. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion rounds now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.